okay? Okay, looks like it's gonna be a very small class. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, I may send a few uh, more emails to advertise the yeah. class a bit more, and uh, hopefully more people are gonna join. So this is a, a, a class really, like a graduate level class on theory computation and applications of nonlinear dynamical systems. So the, the focus application is gonna be on fluid dynamics, but uh, uh, we'll also touch on many other applications as well. So uh, it, it's gonna be a, a bit broader than just the fluid dynamics. And uh, uh, the, the first uh, half of this, uh, this lecture, I'm going to introduce what I'm personally interested in in research. And uh, uh, so basically the whole class is to really prepare you from wherever you are to where you are ready to start tackling this kind of uh, research questions. Okay, so uh, we'll start uh, with something that's in the news the past few days. That's uh, uh, there. Why is it? Uh, okay. Oh, okay. So that's the balloon, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's in the news all the time. Yeah. So MIT is generally not a good place to talk about politics. <laughs> so I will focus on the technical aspects, right? So there is a, a people claim it's a weather balloon, it's a spy balloon, right? Mm -hmm. So that got me thinking from a dynamical system perspective on how feasible it is to actually construct a balloon that uh, uh, you, you use for spying, right, at particular locations. So, so you know, like, it, it uh, took uh, five days for the balloon to drift uh, from here to uh, the coast, uh, which was shut down by F-22, right? So uh, if you look at the whole path it took, right, uh, it's probably weeks time. So the question is actually quite interesting, right? If you want to design a balloon, launch it at a particular place, so that after a few weeks, it ends up at a particular location you want to spy, right? Uh, and uh, for a balloon, the only control you have is to go up or down. I mean, it's not the, the, the hor any horizontal speed you have compared to the wind speed is really negligible. So the really only control you have is to go up or down uh, and to go into different uh, wind conditions, right? So, so the question becomes, okay, if you want to do something, let's say today, based on the forecast you have on what the wind conditions are in the next few weeks, how feasible it is right, to do this, I don't have the answer to the question. But this is actually a very interesting question considering how chaotic the weather pattern is. So a lot of the dynamical systems that is very intimate to important decisions we make, right, are chaotic. So this is uh, uh, the mean sea level pressure difference between a slightly perturbed simulations of what the world is going to be, right? So, so basically, in four days, if you look at the horizontal axis, this is the difference between two simulations. The difference is relatively small, like 60 pascals. If you let the two simulations evolve for 15 days, you can see the difference becomes much more obvious on the order of 600 pascals. If you evolve it for 31 days, which is roughly uh, my estimate of how, how much time it'll take if you launch a balloon in China and it gets to the US, the difference is quite huge, right? It's several thousand pascals. So, so the wind pattern could completely become different. So the question really becomes, uh, do you have enough control over the trajectory, right? If you do something that much early in advance. So I don't know the answer to the question. It would be interesting, like if, uh, <laughs> could be an interesting project to find out. So in general, today a lot of uh, mathematical models, often in the form of dynamical systems, like what we just looked at, drive really important decisions, right? Or even political decisions. And uh, uh, the quality of our decision depends on 
really our understanding and also accurate modeling of these dynamical systems. So this is why I'm very interested in these dynamical systems. Uh, another example, like in more traditional aerospace, right, is the dynamics with respect to turbulence. So this is uh, a, a lot of uh, aerospace engineering really revolves around turbulence. So this is the fluid uh, in a jet engine. And in the jet engine, the flow gets compressed to very high pressure and therefore very high temperature before it gets into the combustion chamber where the fuel is mixed with air and burned, which makes the fuel and air mixture go to even higher temperatures. Right? That's really to increase the thermal efficiency of this jet engine. But the result is that the first stage of the turbines, which extracts energy from the hot combustion product, can literally get melted right, by the hot gas that goes after the combustion. So this is a, a brand new turbine blade the first stage turbine blade compared to a used one that came out of a, a like an overhaul of a jet engine. And you can clearly see the trailing edge actually got melted by the hot gas, right? And this is despite of all these holes from which cooling gas would be bleeding out of the holes to form a shielding layer of cooler air Right, around uh, uh, this turbine blade to prevent the turbine blade from melting. And so the mixture dynamics right, between the very hot combustion product with the thin layer of cooling gas coming out of these holes is critical to how well these are protected. And in fact, uh, a critical difference right, between the old blades and the new blade uh, shown here is really the design of not only where the holes are, but also what the shapes of the holes are, right? In order to basically optimize the cooling dynamic, optimize the mixing dynamics to prevent any part of the blade from melting. And in order to design this kind of uh, cooling holes and uh, uh, location and shape of the cooling holes, you need the very good simulations of how the cooling air is going to mix with the hot combustion product. And these are usually very complex dynamics simulations. Okay, so simulations like this, right? So this is really uh, the uh, simulations of, uh, of how the flow actually transition from laminar flow, a laminar boundary layer, to a turbulent boundary layer around the trailing edge of these uh, uh, blades, right? This is actually why the uh, uh, the trailing edge of these turbine blades are most likely placed to melt. It's actually because the flow actually transitions into turbulence and therefore the mixing dynamics is a lot more difficult to predict and simulate. Okay, so, so this is uh, overall, there is a lot of other examples like this. Really the quality of our decisions, in this case engineering decisions of how to design things depends on our understanding and accurate modeling of these dynamical systems. Okay, so here I'm going to touch uh, uh, several topics that are uh, very interesting to myself and uh, uh, serve as a motivation. So, for example, if we have a computational model, right, here we have a steady state computational model that solves a set of steady state governing equations. So F is our governing equations, right? It is either based on first principle physics or based on data. It doesn't matter, okay? So uh, if you solve this, my, the, the U hat is going to be my solution. So that's the representation of uh, reality that can be achieved from a computational model. But the real world is always going to be slightly different, right? So in the real world, we don't even know if it has a governing equation that is the same dimension as our computational model. So it is rather difficult to say that the real world is a different F. That's not always the case, right? Maybe the real world involves an F that works on a much higher dimension, right? Or it may not 
really have a governing equation in the classical sense at all, right? So what we can do is to pre represent the real world, right? If you plug the real world um, phenomenon, the real world measurement, which is the green U, into our computational model, what you would get is that the right hand side is not going to be zero. Rather, it is something hopefully small, right? If this F tilde is not small, that means we have serious work to do with the computational model. But hopefully, we can improve the computational model to such an extent that F tilde is going to be small. The problem is that F tilde being small is not the real goal of our computational model. The real goal is that uh, not minimizing the modeling error, which is the residual, but minimize the solution error, right? What we really want is that the real world measurement U is as close as possible to the computational solution U hat. And there is a huge gap, actually, between the modeling error and the solution error. So for a steady state system like that, we actually have pretty good theory like that links the modeling error with the solution error in the sense that uh, of the linearized uh, equations. So this is actually something we'll study actually in the first part of this course, that is uh, a dynamics around the fixed point like this. Right, so uh, this matrix, actually the norm, the matrix norm of the inverse of the Jacobi in our computational model represents something very significant to the model stability. So if you know, if you can somehow bound this norm of the matrix, you can actually bound the solution error if you can estimate the modeling error. Okay, so basically, uh, this is actually quite important in a lot of uh, practical cases, for example, involving turbulence. So this is uh, an example of the importance of modeling stability. So if you have a turbulent channel flow, and assuming the direct numerical simulation is the truth, right? So there is a, a, that's the triangle as a function of the distance to the wall. If you use a data-based model to derive a Reynolds average Navier-Stokes solution, so that's actually a, a data-based modeling of the Reynolds stress. And then if you plug this data-based model of the Reynolds stress into the Reynolds average Navier-Stokes equation, you get this very different dashed line from the DNS. So, my solution error in this case is pretty bad. Okay. However, if you use actually exactly the same data and derive a different model, that, that is, instead of uh, uh, use the same data to model the renal stress, you use the same data to model the turbulent viscosity. Right? That's actually a classical way of uh, doing Reynolds average Navier-Stokes, and for a good reason here. You get a more stable model, and uh, you can actually show that uh, these two models using the same data, actually you get exactly the same modeling error. So if you plug the DNS solution into these two equations, the residual actually are exactly the same. However, if you use the second model, you get a solution that's almost identical to the DNS solution. All right, so same modeling error, but a more stable form of model is going to give you much, much better solution error than a very naive way of uh, deriving the model. Right, so that uh, really says the importance. You mean the more stable in the normal sense, right? So the, the, the Jacobian or its norm is, is, is much smaller. Right? Yes, yes. The norm of the inverse of the operator, like in the red, is uh, much smaller for the classical uh, turbulent viscosity based model. All right. 
So again, this basically tells you that the model stability is at least as crucial as minimizing the modeling error, which has really been the attention, right, the focus of attention for many modern approaches in machine learning, for example, is really trying to just minimize the modeling error, paying very little attention to the model stability. So in this course, we will be focusing on model stability. Model stability is a lot trickier if you have a dynamic model. If you have a, for example, a differential equation, or a ordinary differential equation in this case, or even a partial differential equation in the case of, for example, turbulence. In this case, the theory is much less developed uh, compared to the stationary case. So uh, let's say if you have a dynamics modeled as a differential equation, right, such as our uh, model of the uh, global wind pattern or the mixing of hot gas with cooling air uh, in, a turbine, in a turbine engine. Uh, the same thing, if you plug in a real world measurement into our differential equation in this case, you would also get a differential equation that is not exactly satisfied. Instead, you get a residual. And if our model dynamics is good, then the residual should be very small, though it's never possible to make it exactly zero. Okay, so in this case, the modeling error, hopefully small, is F tilde. Now, the real interest in this modeling is the error in the solution, right? Which in this case is usually some function of the solution U. So how is the uh, same function applied to the real world solution different from the same function applied to the computed or simulated solution. So that's really the critical quantity we want to know. However, for a dynamical system, right, the relationship between them is much trickier as we are going to see throughout the semester. It depends on what the model dynamics is, right? Is it periodic? Is it chaotic? If it is chaotic, what can we use to characterize, right? And uh, uh, it also would depend not just on the dynamics itself, but also on the quantity of interest. Are you interested in a snapshot of the solution at some future point, or the trajectory of the solution over a finite period? Or are you interested in the statistics of the solution in some sense? Right? So for the balloon case, we are interested in, in the finite time trajectory. For the turbine engine case, because the melting of the turbine blade happens over many, many hours of running, right? So we are interested in the statistics of the solution, statistics of the mixing dynamics. So this question mark would also depend on what kind of uh, quantity of interest we'll be looking at. But in either case, the stability of the model, right, that now links the modeling error to the error in the quantity of interest is as crucial as how much the modeling error is. Okay, so, so here we are introducing many concepts uh, throughout this course. For example, egodicity. Right, so egodicity relates to the scenario where you are interested in the statistics of the solution rather than a single trajectory. So egodicity has to do with how a long time average of a dynamical system or, or the statistics in time, for example, average in time, um, the standard deviation in time relates to the statistics of a large number of ensembles, usually represented as an ensemble of many different initial conditions. So for example, this is the classical example of a chaotic dynamical system, the Lorentz equation. Okay? So on the left-hand side, you see a trajectory over a thousand time units. On the right-hand side, you see an ensemble of several 
actually, uh, in this case, uh, several hundred million simulations, right? Starting from a small cube of initial conditions, but evolved over five time units. Well, they look a little bit similar, but still significantly different. But now if you increase both the time on both sides, so if you look at the trajectory over not 1,000 time units, but 10,000 time units, and look at the trajectory, now it starts to feel like a bigger space. Similar if you involve exactly the same ensemble from 5 time units to 10 time units, right? It also starts to feel a bigger space. And finally, if you take the trajectory to a hundred thousand time units and also evolve the same ensemble as previously over 50 time units they now look almost exactly the same right so this is the concept of ergodicity of a when you use an ensemble to represent the statistics it is the same as the statistics of a long time evolution of a single trajectory. Okay, another uh, concept we're introducing is the shadowing solutions, right? So on the left, again, is the Lorentz equation. On the left, uh, it is a bunch of simulations with slightly perturbed parameters where the parameter value is shown as a color, okay? On the right-hand side, is the, it's a set of simulations with the same range of parameters, and the same color is showing the parameter value. But on the left hand side, every simulation with the different parameters are starting from the same initial condition, while on the right, they start from a coordinated set of different initial conditions with the explicit goal of making these simulations stick together as long as possible. Right? As we can see that uh, uh, the simulations on the left has completely become different uncorrelated simulations, while on the right, they are still sticking together. Right, so the concept of shadowing is going to be also uh, important in some aspects of these dynamical systems. Uh, that leads to a further application of the statistical sensitivity analysis. So that is uh, if you change the parameter right, uh, of a dynamical system by a little bit or perturb the dynamical system a little bit by introducing a residual, like in our previous case, how would the statistics change? Right, so that's something we'll touch on the second half of the semester. And in particular, can you make a very small change right, into the dynamical system and cause the statistics to change by a lot, right? In the case I posed the question, can a butterfly change the climate? That is, uh, uh, would a tiny perturbation, right, make a difference in the uh, statistics or climate of a dynamical system? So these are interesting questions, and uh, uh, here actually is something uh, Adam uh, worked on, <laughs> right? So, so uh, when does statistics respond uh, even smoothly to parameter changes? So this is a set of a uh, different dynamical system represented as uh, on the left, and as the parameter change uh, from a small value of gamma, as you can see, like the blue curve, to a larger values like in the uh, brown curve you can see that the statistics, in this case, just the average of the, uh, the trajectory, first responds pretty smoothly and becomes less and less smooth and at the end uh, becomes even discontinuous. Right, so these are very interesting questions, particularly asked to larger dynamics that is of real importance. And I would say, like today, we don't have complete answers to these questions yet, right? So in turbulent flows, for example, when would you uh, have cases where a small change in either the geometry or think of an airplane, right? If the pilot touches uh, the control, the uh, turbulent dynamics over the airplane might change suddenly, right? That would be 
situations you really want to avoid. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so these are really kind of uh, my introduction. And uh, um, and about uh, the logistics of the class, let me just uh, open, open the syllable. So the lectures uh, will be Mondays and Wednesdays. And uh, um, yeah, this is the, the main web course site. Uh, main course website is on Canvas, and uh, I also set up a, a Piazza forum. If you wait, why is it? Uh... Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. And uh, there is also a Piazza forum you can look at here. And uh, the tentative schedule is the following. It's over here. Yeah. So today uh, is really the introduction. And uh, uh, the first uh, part of these lectures are really about uh, uh, dynamics around the fixed point. And we'll go from small systems to very large systems, introduce the algorithms of uh, uh, computing the stability right, for a large scale uh, discretized partial differential equation with applications in flow stability and uh, uh, aero elasticity right, that has coupled fluid dynamics and the structural applications. I'll also talk about the error estimation and mesh adaptation in the context of uh, fluid dynamics simulations on steady state. Uh, flows. And then we'll move into unsteady dynamics, uh, things modeled uh, with uh, ordinary differential equations or unsteady partial differential equations. We'll introduce the concept of uh, Lyapunov exponents and Lyapunov factors, starting with ODEs and uh, generalized to discretize the PDEs. We'll study flow crate analysis and the limit cycles, right? So dynamics where things converge on the periodic cycle, either discrete or uh, in continuous time. And uh, this would be a good time to study bifurcation and the numerical continuation. Bifurcation is something uh, when a parameter changes and uh, the dynamics would change suddenly. For example, uh, go from a fixed point to a periodic cycle or go from a periodic cycle to a fixed point, or go from one periodic cycle to a completely different periodic cycle. In the future, we'll study uh, the case when there is a bifurcation between some chaotic dynamics and uh, non-chaotic dynamics. And here we'll uh, look into application into vortex shedding and uh, also combustion instabilities. So then the second part of the uh, semester is going to move into chaotic dynamics. We'll discuss more about the Lyapunov exponents and vectors, a statistical analysis of chaotic systems, okay, and uh, a shadowing, sensitivity analysis, and we'll start looking at uh, uh, data simulation, uh, data-based modeling of dynamical systems. And uh, at the end part of the semester, uh, going into April and May, we'll look at uh, further interesting applications, spatially extended dynamics, turbulent flows, oscillator that sinks and swarms, uh, application epidemics. And uh, uh, so this is really kind of a buffer lecture at the end. Uh, so if in case we need more time on any of these, uh, uh, we'll basically kick this last lecture out. But if not, uh, we'll also look at the other special applications. Uh, so there will be a midterm, um, basically just before spring break. Okay, so um, yeah, so the last week of March is uh, spring break, and uh, uh, there is gonna be either weekly or bi-weekly homework. So, so the homework, uh, a small homework will be weekly and uh, some of the, the larger ones will give you uh, two weeks. And uh, um, 
the, there is no final exam, but there is a final project, right? So the project is uh, really uh, hoping to leverage the, this lecture to help you with uh, the problems you're interested in or your research. And uh, uh, the, the proposal of what you're going to be doing in the final project is a like sim simple one page write up is going to be due uh, just before Patriot's Day, so like uh, middle of April. And uh, uh, the last day of the class is going to be May 15th. Uh, when you're going to be presenting your final uh, project. All right, so that's uh, uh, any questions? Good. All right. Okay. All right. Uh, and and the grades uh, is going to be based on uh, the midterm and uh, uh, the homework and the final project, uh, roughly like a uh, one third each. All right. Okay, so uh, the rest of this lecture, uh, I was uh, basically thinking about, uh, because this is the first time I'm teaching this, and uh, I don't have a very good idea of uh, uh, like from which level I should be starting to teach this. You can see this is a very interdisciplinary subject, right? We have uh, uh, the, the classical study of theoretical dynamical systems is actually not even an applied math subject. It's a, a kind of a, a pure math subject. So, so uh, we'll have a lot of uh, uh, study that uh, leverages on a lot of a uh, pure math concept. So, so this, this is uh, one area I need to have a good gauge on uh, how much I should, uh, where I should start with. It is also closely related to algorithms and a lot of the uh, things we, a lot of the homework actually will do involves at least the some coding, right? So we'll also, I also need to know like where I should start on that. And finally, there is a lot of applications that involves physics, right? So I also need to gauge on like uh, how much, uh, uh, like how much I should be focused on kind of a get you up to speed about uh, uh, the physical aspects. So, so that's why like I, I prepared uh, uh, a quiz uh, this lecture, right, uh, to have you to work on. So it's, uh, it's really just a, a quiz to have a gauge on where I should start. It doesn't count in the grade at all. Uh, so something that I will collect and look at and uh, see like what I can, how I should prepare the future lectures. All right, okay, so that's, uh, that's what you will tell for the remaining of this uh, lecture.